Welcome to this month's SOLIDWORKS seminar. What I'm going to be covering this month is what's new in 2019. Um, we just updated the network license server to 2019 so that we could have EPDM 2019. Our vault was upgraded uh, earlier this month, but it also gives you the ability if you want to load SOLIDWORKS 2019. Now you want to make this decision uh, slowly because if you load up 2019 and you save anything in it, it cannot be opened by anybody using 2018. It's not backwards compatible. So you really want to make sure that when you pull the trigger, all of your team and your vendors and everybody is aware that that switch is going to happen because once you're in 19, you really can't go back. It's pretty tough. All right. Most of what's new in 2019 is actually having to do with assembly um, performance, which is good. In this example I've got here, I've got a assembly with 14,000 components in it. It was actually a uh, project I was working on earlier, and I would have loved to have 2019 during this because it's all about, like I said, assembly performance. So let me get these side by side. I have uh, 19 over here. You can see it down in the lower left-hand corner. And this is 18 over here. You should never run these side by side. I'm only doing this to show you uh, what it's like because this is putting huge tax on my system. Um, but I wanted to talk about looking at the two side by side. If we just look at this assembly, it's really massive. Like I said, 14,000 components. And in 2018, it takes over 10 minutes to load this up lightweight. Um, in 2019, by comparison, this same assembly takes just over five minutes. So it's about 50 times 50% 50 faster. Um, I've seen 30 to 50% faster on these large assemblies. So that's really where it shines. If I had been working on this in 19, I would have been getting stuff done a lot faster because I wouldn't have had all that hourglass time waiting for just the files to come up. Also, once I do have the files open and I go into the graphics area of an assembly and I try and do things like revolve or zoom pan, you'll see that 18 takes a long time uh, to respond to whatever instructions I'm giving it, either with the mouse or I just hit a hotkey and hopefully someday it will actually go into the isometric view. There we go. So you see that when you're in a large assembly like this, uh, your performance is really clunky. It, it seems like things uh, are choppy, like you're dropping frames. And also a lot of times uh, the detail will disappear until you stop rotating it and it takes a second for 18 to come back to life to say, okay, now you can start picking things. Uh, in 19, by comparison, when I revolve this, it's really nice and smooth. Um, even when I'm uh, panning or zooming, doing anything with hotkeys, I get much better results where I get to zoom in uh, very quickly, zoom out. It's all very smooth. If I were to do something like this, you know, you can see that it's a really nice performance where when I try and do the same thing in 18, it's very choppy. So, okay. Now that I've shown you that, I'll get out of 18 because, again, this is just tempting fate. Having both those open, I'll probably lose both of them if I try and run with them open all the time, especially with this large of an assembly in the background. And that comes to another idea about stability. SOLIDWORKS has always had problems with crashing. Um, 18 was particularly bad. I've, Thrown, been thrown out of 18 a lot of times without any type of warning or anything. Uh, 19, I still get uh, some hourglass time, things like that, where it takes a while to come back up. But the big difference is, is it does come back up. Kind of reminds me back in the days of 2016 when the machine would tell me that it wasn't responding and if I just waited, it would come back to life. Where with 18, if it says it's not responding, chances are you're not going to see it again. All right, so I'm going to close out of this for a second, and I'll be right back in in a minute. It actually takes a while to close out of a large file like this as well. And again, 19 is actually faster at closing. One other thing while I'm waiting here, I don't know if you can see in the 
bottom of my screen, there's a little tiny hourglass on top of my 2019 in my task thing down there. That's letting me know that SolidWorks is working on something. A lot of times in 18, you're just confused as to whether the software is doing anything at all. At least in 19, it'll show you that little hourglass to let you know that it's working on some sort of operation. Okay, let's talk about some other big changes besides the open time for large assemblies. Everybody's probably familiar with this task pane over here. Um, I use the file explorer a lot. Some people use the design library. Um, certainly you use the view palette for drawings, but some of these other things like the forum or the custom property tab or even the SOLIDWORKS home. Do you ever use those? Are you ever going to use those? In 19, they give us the ability right here in your task pane, there's an option button where I can actually turn on or off, you know, items that I never use. Kind of get this more lean. So it's only got the tabs that you actually use. Another option that's big here, and it's on the very first page of options, very first one they put in here, recent documents. So if you are a regular SOLIDWORKS user, you probably know that when you start up in the daytime, in the morning, and you hit the R key, it shows you everything you were working on the day before, your recent files. It shows you a list of, I believe, 10 of them, and then you can expand that out and it'll show you 20. Now they've given us the ability to go up to 100 if you want. The default it has is set to 50, so it'll show you back days and days of your work, and you just click on it, it'll open it. If you're not familiar with that, here it is. I just hit the R key and here's all the stuff that I've been working on recently. If I wanna open it, I can just click on it. It'll open in whatever default setting it is. So if you do an assembly, usually it'll do a large design if it's this big of an assembly, but you also have the ability to switch the mode. So opening something uh, lightweight, like I said, we've got about two times faster with 19 They've also made the large design review open a little bit faster. It's still not much of a, a wait because it takes about 37 seconds for it to open up this assembly in large assembly mode, unless you have it warn you that the large assembly mode's coming up. So I had this thing come up. I usually say don't show again because I already know this information, but I wanted to show you if you've never used large design review in the past, those top six checkboxes, those were always there. In large design review, it allows you to open up, you can see the feature manager tree, sub-assemblies, components, mates, that type of stuff. You can measure, you can do cross sections, but you really couldn't change the assembly at all. All you could really do is just take readings off of it. Now in 19, we've got four more checkboxes in here where we can actually insert components, move them around in the assembly and mate them without actually having all 14,000 files loaded into RAM. So like I said, this takes about 30 seconds to open up, which is of course much faster than the five to six minutes that it takes lightweight. Again, if you look down here, you see the little hourglass 19 telling you that it's working on something. So if you're ever wondering what's going on, you see that hourglass, something's happening. So this is large design review. You see it, it takes some corners on what happens with the graphics when I rotate it. It's not as nice as when I have this thing um, just in the large assembly mode. Okay, but here's the two boxes that I wanted to show you that are new. The insert component and the make component. You see it's grayed out right when you open up your part in lightweight. I'm sorry, large design review. How to get into it is if you right click, there's a choice to edit the assembly. This does have some stipulations and it'll tell you right away. If an assembly has a sub assembly that is flexible, so it's able to move, you cannot edit it in large design review just because it doesn't know the location of that component. And so it just, there's no dice. If, if the thing is flexible, it would have to load that. And then if there's any external references, all of a sudden it's loading files and you're not in large design review. Anymore. You're actually in SOLIDWORKS. So that's not the way to go with an assembly like this. Uh, 
All right, so let me close out of this. Yes, sir. Um, on the, uh, the, the first thing you showed with all this stuff checked, and you said you're not sure again. Is there always an option to turn that back on? Or no. Um, so the question that I was just asked, oh, here's one. Here's the difference between 18 and 19. When you click on it when it's busy, in 18 it would give you the, you can either wait or you can close it. And that was it. You had two choices. Here you have the same choices, but at least it shows you if the CPU is doing anything. Um, and if I just wait, it'll go. Like I said, this one reminds me a lot of 2016, where in 2016 you'd have the hangups, but if you just waited, it would come back eventually. In 18, I'm not having that feeling so much. If it hangs up a lot of times, it's never coming back in 18. 19 seems like it's stepping back to that. If you just give it some patience, it'll come back. I'm sorry, Monty's question earlier was, what if you say, don't ask me something again? And if you do that with any of those, just go into your options and there's this messages and warning and here's a list of all the stuff you said, don't ask me again. If you check that and say, okay, it'll remove it from the list. And then next time that dialogue box will pop up and get in your way again. Okay. All, right. Mm -hmm. all right, that's the same in 18. That's been there for a while. Um, okay. Back to the show. So I'm gonna open up this assembly in that large design review. This one's quite a bit smaller. Here's that don't ask me again. So it won't ask me again unless I go back into the options and clear that. But here's the assembly. It opens in seconds because it's only 1,400 parts instead of 14,000. And I have this. This assembly does not have any flexible subassemblies. So that means when I right click the top and say edit the assembly, Instead of it giving me a warning saying I can't do that, it gives me these two. This is the big game changer. So when I was working on that giant assembly with the tens of thousands of parts, if I ever wanted to put in a new system, new subassembly or new component, I had to resolve that assembly, which would give me a nice 10 or 15 minute break while I waited for all the files to come into RAM. Here, I don't need to do that. I can insert a component without ever leaving the large design review. Um, right, downloads is where I want to go. Here it is. Okay, so if you're wondering where I got these cool things, I got these from GrabCAD. Uh, I'm pretty sure these files might be stolen just because they don't look like they're by a hobbyist. <laughs> but I needed something with thousands, of par a thousand parts in it, and someone had posted this. But so this is a you know large assembly, but I'm able to drop a new component into it without leaving the large design view. So my computer is still, if I go into what's open in SolidWorks. Technically, no files are open in SolidWorks. The assembly file is open, but it didn't have to load up all of the reference geometry inside the assembly. So as far as my computer, it's running at like top speed. It doesn't have a ton of stuff that's got to access from the RAM. So putting in a part is cool. I'm moving it around the same way that you move a component typically in an assembly. A left click and drag moves it axially, and a right click and drag uh, rotates it. But now that I've got this thing in the assembly, if I select a face, hold my control key down, select another face, boom, I'm able to mate these things into place in large design review. Move it around. Also, uh, it's not just the like quick mates that you can do. You can go in here and you can do I'd say about 70% of the mates. Some of them like profile center and things like that where it has to solve with the geometry around it, you're not gonna be able to do. But things like distance, limit, those types of uh, mates are still gonna work for you. So if I wanted this thing to be a certain distance away from this face,
and put that in and made it into place. Okay, I got that mate pretty much wrong. You can also edit mates, not only the mates that you just put in, but any existing mate. So I can start deleting mates, rearranging things, putting stuff into place, again, without loading all that stuff into RAM, without taking a lot of time. So this is why I'm saying that 2019 is probably a good fit for people in Google that work with large assemblies. If you have a small thing that's 100 parts, it won't do anything for you. But after that, you already know the pain that's in SOLIDWORKS. A lot of load time, a lot of crashing, a lot of things like that. If you're in large design review, a lot of those problems go away right away. But I can go in and edit this because I didn't mean to pick that face. There we go, that's the one I wanted. And you see that it solves that mate for me. So a lot of work, uh, things that you can do in large design review, definitely I think that that's the way you should roll. Because here, even though I don't have anything loaded up, if I need to get into a subsystem or anything like that, I can just right click and open that sub assembly. So that's what I'll do in these large designs. I open the large design and large design review, and then when it comes time to make the changes, I'll open the sub assemblies or the components underneath in their own window, leave the uh, top level low. Okay. In the recent, answer the breaks. Okay. Some more stuff inside of an assembly. This assembly actually has toolbox components. I know we don't use those very much in SolidWorks, or I could Google X here, but I'm, other groups do. So I wanna show people some of the changes when it comes to hardware. When you're looking at mates, it's not uncommon to have 100 mates in something this size. It's not that large of an assembly, but they come quick. You know, all you need is 30 parts, you made them, put three mates on them, all of a sudden you're close to 100 parts already, or 100 mates already. And sorting through these can be a hassle, which mate even goes to what? So there's a couple ways that they allow you to group mates inside of 2019. When I right click on this, there's this choice, group mates. If you're using toolbox components, you can say, show me all the toolbox mates in their own folder. So now those all come and now I can see, you know, these things are underdefined, which makes me cranky. So if I click here, lock rotation, I know those are all rotations on toolbox parts because it's from the folder of toolbox parts. And now all the little underdefined minus symbols are gone from in front of my toolbox parts. Okay, but I already saw the look of disapproval from everybody when I started talking about toolbox because we don't use toolbox, right? There's more to it than that. If you notice when I right clicked here, I had the group mates. There's also something called by status. I'm gonna do a couple of crazy things here that are sure to make SOLIDWORKS unhappy with me. One of the things I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put in an overdefining mate. Put that in there. Should overdefine it. Hmm. Yep, yep. Starting to get some warnings here with what's going on. Also, if you suppress a component, that can lead to mates blowing up or mates suppressing. So, what you can do in this case is when I right click on the mate group, and do group mates, I can also do it by status. So it'll put everything that's fine in one folder, solved. If I have any overdefined, it'll put those in our folder. It also, if there's an error, if there's an overdefining one, it'll flag those in its own folder too, as well as giving me a folder of suppressed mates. So again, it's cleaning up that whole thing. Send me scrolling up and down 100 mates. I could say, oh, these mates are all suppressed because the thing's fixed. I don't even have to worry about those or it's suppressed or whatever. And it does resolve. So when I unsuppress things, you know, I had a bunch of suppressed mates. Now that folder's gone. 
because I don't have any suppressed. I still have a lot of overdefined ones. If I get rid of the mate that's making that happen, then all of a sudden all I have is fasteners and salt. I go back to it. So when you start getting mate errors, instead of being like, where do I even start? It's nice to group these to say, hey, what's been affected by the changes that I did? Uh, give you some more time. Also, when it comes to mates using toolbox parts. So remember, I talked about the fact that I don't like this to be underdefined. I want this thing to be in place and not rotating. So in my options in 2019, if I go to the toolbox options, there's actually a choice to lock rotation on all new, new toolbox items. It is about time. So that one was way easy for him. I don't know why it took so long. But yeah, if I uh, grab this edge and drop that in there. Everybody knows what I just did. If you hold your Alt key and grab a circular edge, you can go to another circular edge. But did you know that if you hold your Control key and your Alt key at the same time and do the same thing, you can make a copy and made it at the same time? Wow. Ooh. And with my handy checkbox, that one's locked in rotation, that one's locked in rotation. Any toolbox part I put in from now on is going to be locked in rotation. Sure, it was in the, uh, whoops not the section view, in the options under toolbox. So there, you know, there's a whole wizard toolbox setting area. In 19, there's a checkbox that says uh, automatically lock rotation on concentric. All right. Let's go back to the top level here. Oh, just after I said it was more stable. <laughs> yes, it crashes much faster than 2018. <laughs> I wanted you guys to, make, to know that this was not recorded, that this is live. Uh, yeah. All right. But the recording won't do that. No, but you can always edit that. <laughs> No, I usually just post them warts and all. Um, any questions so far on the stuff I've covered as far as the large design review and the, the mates and things like that? Yeah, um, will you always repeat the questions? I will try to repeat the questions for you. George asked me if I would repeat the questions, <laughs> and the answer is yes, I will try to repeat his questions. All right. Let's go back to this one. I didn't click it in large design review. Remember, it just took a couple of seconds to load this thing up, a uh, large design review. It's not that large of an assembly in comparison to some of the other ones. But it is nice. It shows you how long it took in the last one, and it'll show you, uh, you know, how your status is going. So if I'm going to edit this one part in this assembly, yes, sir. does it wake it up over here on the, uh, the, the screen? Okay. So his question was, if I select something, I, I think that your question was that if I select something in the graphics area, is it going to highlight in the feature manager tree? Um, and the answer is definitely yes, it's going to. I have to wait for 19 to respond. I can tell it's not responding again. It gives you that old fashioned Windows hourglass over the icon. Uh, so if you just wait for that to disappear, then that whole clicking and it turning gray and asking you if you want to close um, should go away. There we go. Okay. So we're back in here. So yeah, when I select it, it highlights in the tree. If that is not happening for you, that is an option. Luckily, I was headed into those options anyway. So I'll just show you while I'm there. Because I was going into the feature manager options. Um, and this is where it says scroll selected item into view. Um, you want that turned on. Um, yeah. Also, what I'm going to turn on here is they've got a new folder. Typically, these folders will not show up. They're all set to automatic. So the only time you're going to see one of these folders is if somebody's put it in the assembly for you. But if you want to make your own, 
there is something called markups now inside of, uh, you can do it in assemblies, you can do it in drawings, you can do whatever. I don't know if you guys have used the e-drawing markup capability where you can take a model and you can write all over it and redline it basically in three dimensions. It's a similar thing. I'm gonna wait. I thought it was going to be a short presentation, but be patient. All right. If I come up here, you'll see that I've got the markups. I can insert a markup view, which allows me to, um, you know, put in notes or start drawing things on the model. And that'll be saved in this markups. It'll show you who did the markup. They can send you back the assembly. They can send you back the drawing. They don't have to actually get printed out and give you a red line with it. They can do it right in the model, send it over to you. Uh, when you're done with it, you can uh, just kill that red line. Well, uh, a markup uh, is going to be something that's just temporary. It's a communication tool. Sorry, George. The question was, what's the difference between an annotation and a markup? So with an annotation, that's something that you want to have on a drawing or something, or when somebody opens it up, you want them to read that if it's a vendor or supplier, whoever's going to see it. When you're doing markups, that's just a temporary thing where you're like, hey, this is too big. Hey, this needs to be shifted down here. It's, it's a design type of thing uh, where you're sharing with somebody. And again, when you're finished with the markup, you would just delete it. So it's a temporary thing. Where an annotation is going to be permanent, a markup is just temporary while you're in the design mode. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Another new uh, item that's in 2019 is they've changed a little bit of the fillet and chamfer command. It's still the same. In 18, they did a lot of changes where if you put in a fillet, you can change it to a chamfer. If you put in a chamfer, you can change it to a fillet. That stuff still goes. Uh, but the only thing that's new here is when I select to do an edge fillet, you got to turn off tangent propagation to work on this because I don't want it going around the corner for this idea. And the thing that I'm doing here is there's the ability to do a partial edge Fillet. So typically when you pick an edge and you say fill it, it rounds off that entire edge that you pick. What this new uh, setting allows you to do, once you activate it, is you can step this back however far from the edge, the end of the edge that you want. So that when you put in that fillet, it just goes to that point. Well, we're trying to show you cool stuff. Uh, like I said, there is a lot of fluff. If you watch some of the videos on what's new, there's a lot of stuff that's just marketing things or stuff that's not half, not cooked all the way. I'm trying to leave that out. I'm just showing you the stuff where you're going to be like, yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> half not cooked all the way. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yep. I want to get in trouble. All right. All right, so I did partial chamfer. Is that a sheet metal part? That is a sheet metal part. You can chamfer sheet metal parts. That came uh, around years ago. You used to not be able to put in uh, multiple thickness sheet metal ones, but now they let you do end treatments to stuff, uh, and it'll still solve. Hey, my brake's missing. I must have crashed. All right, give me a second. I can put it back. Because one of the things about a file like this is that it's probably a vendor part, right? And so if we take a look at this thing that I've put into my assembly, I open it in its own window. 
I've already got 1,400 parts. If you go to evaluate, you can find out how many components are in a particular assembly. Down near the bottom, I'm about to put 100 more in. I absolutely do not need 100 parts in this if I'm just buying this thing. All I need to know is what it's shaped like. So, what they give you the ability to do um, is they give you the ability to simplify this. Um, I'm having a no here. Hold on. Uh, let me go back to that sheet metal part for a second. Because um, there is one more new thing in, in assemblies that I wanted to talk about. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, one of the things is dealing with external references. So if you build a part inside of the assembly itself, what will happen with that is it'll start putting in references. If you say this hole is drilled right over that hole. In the past, you could see what external references were in the assembly, but if you wanted to lock or break references, you would have to go to the components themselves and start managing them there. Um, you can do it from the assembly now. So they made some changes here. One thing, the first thing that got me was it used to say list external references. If you're looking for the word list, it's not there anymore. It's also, it used to be around here. They moved it down so that it was harder to find, and they took the word list out of it, so you were looking for a different thing. But that's the one. You'll see that it's much different. Before, it would just show you pretty much a group of all of them, and you could break all of them, or you could lock all of them. This allows you to select and lock just certain sketches. So you can pick and choose what you want to break and lock from a particular component, and you can do it from the assembly level. So you shouldn't have external references on your files anyways, but if you're on R&D, I understand that happens, and this allows you to go in there and start turning them off really quickly when you do want to get rid of them. All right, hopefully it comes back to the assembly, because last time I tried that was when we had the issue. All right, and the next thing I want to talk about, I finally remembered, what I was doing in that break assembly was trying to keep an assembly simplified. Come on. I'm, I'm knowing better than to click because it's giving me that hourglass, but. There we go. Okay. I'll just do the control tab over to this one. Okay. What I wanted to do here was use a feature that they introduced years ago that has never worked, called defeature. And the idea behind defeature is if you have a really, uh, or the original idea behind defeature was if you had a really complex part, you could say, you know what, I don't want to send somebody all the secret sauce and this file's too big, I want to dumb it down a little. And so you would use this style, where it goes into the model and tries to take stuff that's smaller than a certain size, you set up some parameters on what you want to get rid of, and then when it's finished, your part has a million errors and it won't save, because the, the thing was just terrible. Okay, but this one that they've put here is useful. Again, the idea here is that this uh, assembly is way too complex for what I needed to do. I just want to make sure that nobody puts anything on top of it. You know, the, the size and shape is represented in the assembly, but I don't necessarily need to have 105 components in my assembly when a lot of them are things like balls inside of a ball bearing. That's ridiculous. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, I would like to make some groups and I'll show you uh, some different examples when I'm done here, but I'm just gonna do one where I can pick, you know, I want that, that, 
and that. That pretty much shows me what the, what the size of the thing looks like. I have choices on how much information I'm going to put in there. I've found that the bounding box and the polygon outlines are really terrible. They, they don't give you what you think you're going to get. Um, the cylinder one, in this case, works really well. What it's going to do is it's going to extrude a bunch of cylinders that are this shape. So I have the keep out area. But when I do something like that, I'm not going to see where all those access screw holes are. I'm just going to have a, a barrel in there. So you can actually just say, I want to use that original geometry from those three parts. And then it'll show me a preview once this thing is finished processing. of what that's going to look like. The preview is not coming up like I was hoping, but that's all right. OK, so it's dumbed it down for me. Now, the, I've got a, a few different choices here. Um, one of them is I can just store it into the file and be like, I'm not finished with it yet. I'll be back, and I'm going to be adding more stuff later, because you can go back into it and edit it just like any feature. Uh, they also, this is just something that the marketing people convinced them to put in, that I can send my stuff right to the web in 3D Content Central. I'm not going to be doing that. But here's the one. I want to save it as its own document. So it's going to give me a part file instead of an assembly file, and I can drop that in as a placeholder for where this break is. I do have another option here. I talked about external references. That will give you external references. So if you want the thing to update, if the vendor sends you a new file, you can load that new file, update the existing one. It has a link back to the original. But there we go. There's my new file. So I can drop this into the assembly. I can see where all the access bolts are. It's linked to the original. So if the original ever changes, this thing's going to update. That, again, is an option if you want to do that. But this obviously is going to take down a lot of the noise. If you're doing this for all the vendor assemblies that you're putting into your thing, your part count's going to go down, obviously. Um, so it's just a nice thing to be able to sort of run leaner at that top level assembly. So instead of using this component, I can use that one. And I just saved myself 104 parts that I got to load into RAM if I ever do this thing full weight. OK, so like I said, a lot of 2019's stuff is all for people that work with assemblies. Yes, is that, sir? Is that one part, or is it? That is a single component multi-body. You just pick the three different Yep, but it comes in, you'll see, in my feature. Uh, so the question was, is that three pieces? Because I picked three pieces when I set it up. But it just saves out however many bodies. Since these couldn't merge, it's actually two bodies. Only the outside ones could merge, but that inside spline had a bearing where it doesn't actually touch the outside. So if it doesn't, you know, when they try and turn it into one volume, if there's a gap, obviously, it's going to have multi-bodies. But that's what it does. It gives you a multi-body part instead of having an assembly. Yes, sir. Another question. So you come back later on to the design and decide, hey, you know what, I actually need that assembly. Uh -huh. And I don't okay. need that part that I was just trying to make a pillar for the piece. Can well, you do a swap out on that? Well, you can do a swap out just like I did before when I reloaded it. So his question was, uh, you swapped out the assembly for a part. Can you, you can go the opposite way. I mean, I can just go to the assembly. One nice thing is if you do have it with the link to the external reference, you can open the part, right click, edit in context. And if you have access to where that assembly is stored, it'll open up that assembly. So now you have a file. You can swap them.
All right, moving right along, more assembly stuff that we can do. So I want to open up this subassembly. And I'm going to do an exploded view on this assembly. So exploded view is definitely not something new. We still do them the same old way where they're, each configuration can have its own exploded view. So that's where it's going to be stored. In your assembly, you say, let's do an exploded view. And you can start picking pieces. Really? Wow. Yeah, when I was telling you I didn't crash that much this morning, um, it was saving it all up for this afternoon, I guess. Oh, there's going to be a lot of editing. <laughs> It seems that uh, if I don't save a file and I try and switch back to the other one, I'm, that's when I'm run, usually running into issues here. Mm, I have to wait for it to open to let you know. Okay, so I had a question earlier. What version of 19 am I on? You think I would know. Um, if you ever want to know about that, just say about SolidWorks, uh, Service Pack 3. So I could go a couple more. Maybe that's why I'm crashing so much, um, or at least that's a good excuse. All right, let's try this again. And we go to the exploded view. Yeah, okay, no explosion. Nice. I did not want that one to go in there. Come here. That's what I want. Okay, and then I'm going to do these. So when you're doing an exploded view of an assembly, it's obviously going to explode and collapse in the same order that you did them in. Um, it doesn't really make a difference when you're talking about the 2D explosion, because who's going to know which, which order I did them in, right? The only time it really becomes apparent when you're in, uh, have an exploded view, I don't know if you know you can do this, but you can animate it. That is wrong, right? The, the screws are not supposed to go in before the rest of the thing. So one of the nice things that they've given us uh, in this is they gave us a rollback bar. So it's just like the rollback bar inside of your feature manager tree, where you can actually reorder how things happen. So now that one happens first. You can also, when you're um, editing the feature, you can use this rollback bar the same way that you use a rollback bar inside of SOLIDWORKS, meaning that wherever that blue line is, that's where this next explosion is going to happen. So you can, if you're like, oops, I forgot to explode, you can roll back to the point that you forgot to explode and do it and then just do the rollback just like you do in the feature manager tree. So it's a lot more intuitive, especially if you're used to the feature manager tree rollback and you've done that sort of operation before. It's really nice because you can change the operation that it happens in without a lot of problems. You could do that before, but it really wasn't a very good idea. Um, it would get confused as to where it was. Um, this one seems to be doing better. And it's nice that you can reorder them. You can drag that rollback bar and do them whenever you want. Also, when you're doing something like this, you can save it. I showed you the animation. When you do the animate explode, and it gives you this little button here that allows you to save as an AVI. Here's something that also, it's about time. 
You can now save animations as MP4s as well, 10 years after they are <laughs> now the standard. Uh, SOLIDWORKS finally figured, hey, nobody's using AVIs anymore. Why don't we use MP4s as well? You still can save it as an AVI, but the MP4 is going to be a much smaller file size, and people will be much happier to see it. All right, so I already showed you the, the feature. Oh, okay. I'm going to try this. I'm going to save this assembly before I switch over to the other one because that seems to be where I keep dropping out is when I'm switching between an assembly or trying to close it down without saving the changes. We'll see. Hey, it opened up. All right. So those are really the things that I'm going to be using all the time when I'm in assemblies, large design review, mating inside of it, playing around with that exploded view, um, also probably defeaturing some really complex vendor stuff. Um, some of this other stuff might not work, so, might not use it a lot, but I wanted to show you some of the new stuff where it's headed, especially this next one, because it really doesn't work very well. But the what it could do for us is pretty amazing. So what you need to do to get this trick to work is you need to have a black and white JPEG image that you put as a texture onto your file. So hopefully I can uh, get to where I need to go easily enough. User. Almost there. Oh, I took it out of there. Is it on my... It must be on my desktop. Um, hold on a second here. It was on my second monitor, and now I don't know where the heck it, it ended up. Ah, there it is. It's called grayscale. Okay. God willing, I'll be able to just drop, drag and drop. Hey, it worked. Now, I just want to put it on a face. Okay. So this is how it begins. When you've got this thing in there, you can edit disappearance and make it whatever size you want the geometry that you're gonna put on here to be. So if I go into advanced mapping, I can control the size of these little dots, All right? Also, um, I can move them around. There you go. I grab this, I can spin it using uh, those controls, or if I use these uh, arrows, I should be able to uh, move it up or down. There we go. So I can get it sort of into the spot that I'm after as far as where I want it located and whether or not um, you know, the, the image is where I want it. So that's where I want it. I want to put, what am I doing here? What I'm doing here is I'm going to put, I can put either little bumps or I can put little holes in here with that shape. Um, they show in their example them doing a neural pattern. I really tried to show you the neural pattern. It's rough. <laughs> it was not coming out as a nice smooth neural. Um, but I'll show you how to do this one. It's called a 3D texture. If you type in 3D texture, it'll be grayed out if you don't have any JPEGs applied to any surfaces. But if you once you've put a texture on there, that becomes a, an availability. And you tell it which body you want it to do. And then all the textures that you have on that body will be displayed. So you can do more than one at a time. You, I could do all four faces at once if I needed to. I just need to check which one it is. And you'll see that it's, those showed a little mesh. What this does is 
this one controls how much this face comes off the original face. This one controls how deep those divots are. Or, or how, uh, how tight to the divots you're getting. This white and black up, down, that just reverses it. Whether you want to have bumps or whether you want to have holes is up to you. Okay, so that would have been pretty tough to model. Well, not, not really. I could have done it, but it would not have been this fast. Also, so what do I do with it now? You see, it looks like a mesh. What it's done for me is it's created two different things. I've got the original solid body here, which I can show, and I've also got a graphics body, which is what I'm going to be showed this 3D texture on. If the graphics body is the thing that's open, this is a mesh file, basically, I can save it out as an STL and have this printed, which is good because a lot of the features that I get off of this thing, I don't think you can... <laughs> there's any other process but 3D printing to give you that. But this allows you, if I open this, if I save this as an STL, they're, they're divots. <laughs> okay, so if I open this, The desktop, set this to all files. Where the heck did I save it, George? Uh, in the file. Right. Um, actually, you know, I've, for just such an emergency, I've already got one saved. <laughs> so this is me opening up an STL. It's going to turn it into a solid for me, but you can see what they would get on their end to do the 3d printing. So you can put some crazy textures onto faces pretty easily. Okay, one last, a uh, couple last things I want to show you. So that's it for the SolidWorks stuff. They do have some new things in e-drawings. You actually have to um, have a file open in SolidWorks. Um, if I go into, if you have something with uh, multiple configurations, typically what happens when you save a part as multiple configurations, it only saves a 3D skin of one of them, whichever one you have active. So if you open that in eDrawings, you can only open up the configuration that they saved as. Even if it's got 20 other versions, you only get the one that they saved. In 2019, you can go to any configuration and you can say add display data mark and you see it gives it this little symbol there. What that means is when I save it, it saves the e-drawing information for whatever configurations have that mark. So you can open up it, open the thing up in e-drawings and have, see all 20 different configurations. Yep. If you have them marked, exactly. So I marked this one. It took me a while because when you read the thing, it says, oh, you can do this now. But then, <laughs> How do you do yeah, when you open up eDrawings, I didn't see this configuration. It doesn't work until you go into SolidWorks, check on all those configs and save it once. Once you do that, then you can dial up different versions of this thing in eDrawings. So I don't have to open up the file in SolidWorks and worry about changing anything. I can just view it and be like, oh, what do you do? You put a bigger one in that, this one as a whole on the other side. I can take a look at all the different configurations and interrogate it inside eDrawings really easily. I almost got out with this one. Uh, there was a new thing in uh, SolidWorks 
I think 2017, 2018, somewhere around there. Uh, it's called a topology study. And they've changed it a bit. Let me make sure I got my simulation turned on here. Um, because what it does is you can say, okay, in this example, what I did to get it to this point is I put what face was going to be fixed. So all eight holes on the back are going to be fixed. And then there's a thousand pound weight sitting on this shelf. And then I put in some parameters, which allowed me to set up what goals I want. The two new things that are in 19 is they have more goals. Before it was basically, you could say, I want the same stiffness, but less material, or I want this thing as light as possible without falling under the factor of safety. What they give you now when you're setting up your goals When I pick a goal, there's a whole lot more options in here than just doing it by stress. I can do it by factor of safety. I can get it up to a point, like 75% of yield or something like that. I can fill in a lot more information than just try to make this thing light. Now, when it does show you the results, curses. It shows them to you uh, tessellated. So how the, uh, how the analysis does this trick is it takes this piece and it breaks it into thousands of little pyramids and then tests each pyramid for stress and strain. And the ones that are below a certain stress, it starts popping those pyramids out of there. If you take a look at the original, which isn't coming up for me, um, it looks like the thing was made out of something and they dropped it. There's bunches of pieces missing. But uh, they give you the ability now to save it out as a smoothed mesh data. So what it does, instead of this being jagged, it smooths that out as best as it can. It still would be a pain to try and machine this thing, obviously, but it gives you a great uh, look to, hey, I can get rid of all this material. I can do a pattern of just spars here and not have that whole plate and drop a lot of weight. So they've improved that. The fact that you can actually save it out um, as a simplified uh, mesh type of file um, is pretty good. All right. There's also another tool that I use and I talk about it all the time. Hopefully other people have started using it because it's pretty cool, but it's called Treehouse. It comes with SolidWorks. It's good for laying out a design or if you're pretty much through a design, but you have to start just adding some little pieces and things like that. What this allows you to do is if I drop an existing assembly into here, what it's gonna do is it's going to show me um, the hierarchy of this assembly. I probably should have done a smaller assembly, but that's okay. The larger the assembly, the, uh, the bigger the treehouse is gonna end up being. <laughs> Now it's getting to move on. Okay, so it takes a look at the feature manager tree, all the files that are inside of the part. It takes a look at how you've put them into sub-assemblies and all that sort of thing. Yeah, I really should have done a smaller assembly. <laughs> it's okay, Monty said I had to make this last an hour, so here's, here's how it's happening. Crash two times and then I drop a giant assembly into treehouse. Uh 
this thing doesn't start moving in 30 seconds, I'm going to kill it and put in a smaller assembly. There's more than one open. Okay. Okay, there we go. So this is what it does for me. So each one of these um, branches is a subassembly. So I can see what's in there. So the nice thing about this is if I need to start fleshing it out, like, hey, this needs a drawing, I can drop drawings in there, I can drop new parts or new subassemblies in there, and you see that it's got my, um, it's got my templates in there. So it's actually creating a file. If I give this file a name, it'll open up a part file with that template and it'll be in the assembly, made it into the location on the origin. So you can lay out an entire assembly here with components that are existing or which is blank parts. This is not new. We've had this for a while. It's one of those things that, like on the tips and tricks, I always try and push it, but... <laughs> the only thing that is new in this is in the past, when you would right click it and you would go to properties, it wouldn't show you all the properties. It would just show you like a truncated list of typical properties like description or material or something like this. Here, I can put in any property. I can even put in con configuration specific properties. Yeah, I can start adding properties. So not only can you flesh out all, you know, what needs a drawing. Here, I'll drop drawing templates on all of those and it'll link them together. You'll end up with a file that has an external reference to that file already. Um, but this also allows you to start putting in metadata and stuff like that into your design before you've ever modeled anything. So you know what project number it is or what the vendor is. You can put in all that information before you start modeling. This is, if you go to the tools, yeah, same place you guys find like your network license manager and stuff like that. Um, it's right there, Treehouse. Um, sometimes I'll just use it. Sometimes it's nice to lay out a new design. Sometimes I'll just use it to figure out what the heck's going on with the design I'm working in right now. Because it's nice. It gives you a visual display of how the hierarchy is working, what subassemblies are nested under which, without having to go through the feature manager tree and try and figure it out myself. Okay. So that is new stuff in 19. Again, talk to your vendors, your suppliers, your team. Do not go on 19 by yourself, because if you save the assembly in 19, everyone will hate you. You all have to go at the same time because it's not backwards compatible. But if you saw something in here, especially all the assembly tricks that might make your job easier, uh, we will be happy to assist you at Gecko Systems with your 2019 upgrade. Cool. Thanks, everybody, for coming. <laughs>